This is the Amazon Planet Podcast, episode 71. I am your host, Joel Amadon. Thank you for joining me on this never-ending quest to figure out how to teach better. <laughs> Today on the podcast, are you wait, just wait. You know what? Stop the podcast. Go to another podcast. One of my favorite podcasts, 60 songs that explain the 90s. If you're familiar with it, awesome. If not, you're welcome. If you have any relationship to the 90s, to the music of the 90s, it is a pleasure to listen to and to hear the host, Rob Harvilla of The Ringer, senior staff writer, music critic, talk about the music, the songs, the influences, the surrounding groups of a certain song, of a certain music, and to hear the context and to hear the conversations around it. And he is literally teaching us about the 90s. So if you have never engaged with it, go to it. Go go now. Go. Run. And listen to it. And then come back, and I swear, listen to me talk to Rob Harvilla about his teaching. He doesn't necessarily think he's a teacher, but he is influencing our relationship with the 90s. So thus, he's teaching us about the 90s. And so I had an ch- opportunity. I reached out and was able to connect with Rob. And it's been a while. We've had some back and forth. And finally, we got it scheduled. And just on the day before he released his 61st song on the 60 songs that explain the 90s, which says, hey, that's success. If you go beyond this outward goal that you want, like, hey, I want 60 songs that explain the 90s, I'm going to do 61. And now he's actually going to do 90 songs. On the day before he released his 61st song, he uh, joined me on the podcast, and we had a conversation about teaching, about the podcast, um, about the 90s, about building relationships with an audience or building relationships with the I mean, in this case, the content and learning about music, musical tastes and and thinking about how to be representative, but also personal in your teaching, which is something we need to do. Even as a math teacher, I knew like building relationships with my students was really important and thinking about how do I represent myself? How do I let let them in a little bit? Because they need to know me a little bit in order to be for me to be more effective teacher, to me to make that connection, to build a, a conduit, if you will, in order to help them learn the mathematics that I am um, helping, that I want them to learn, right? And so, anyway, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a while. I'm ex- so excited to share it with you. So without further delay, here is my conversation with Ringer senior staff writer and host of the podcast, 60 Songs That Explain the 90s, Rob Harvilla. Today on the podcast is Rob Harvilla, music critic and senior staff writer for The Ringer and host of one of my favorite podcasts, 60 Songs That Explain the 90s. Welcome, Rob. How are you? Hey, man. It's great to be here. I'm, I'm doing great. I really appreciate this, but it's great to talk to you. I am splendid. So I have a note at the top of my questions mm-hmm. that say, avoid being the Chris Farley show. So, <laughs> oh geez like remember uh, that time rob when you paul mccartney you <laughs> yeah no it's I, I i it's quite not quite that dynamic but that is very kind it's that's, well, i was trying to explain that to my daughter in the on the car ride to school today and i'm one. like yeah. it's much funnier when he does it so. <laughs> as with most things chris farley did yeah that's, that's right that's absolutely true that's right so uh, I wanted to have you on the podcast. One, I, I just, I love, love your podcast and it's right in my wheelhouse. And I think that's well, thanks, uh, for uh, being a, a child of the nineties and, and growing up and being, that's when the yeah. music I was into was, was up and, and all that, but thinking about, so this podcast is about learning how to teach better. And, mm-hmm. and, and, and I was just over and over again, every Thursday when a, an episode was released and I was, learning about, you know, the artists and the, um, the specific song or the context around it. And I was just like, I'm learning more about this era that I thought I knew a lot about. And I, I didn't, (laughs) I didn't actually. And so seeing you as a, as a teacher and teaching, uh, us, the listeners, uh, about the nineties, 
uh, through songs and, and just was like, Hey, let's, let's see if I'm gonna reach out to Rob and see if, uh, yeah. if you want to come on to talk about his teaching. Do you often talk to non-teachers for this podcast? They're teachers. I mean, here's my thing. I think everyone is a teacher somehow, right, some way. Right. And I know, I, I, you know, from our email, I know you're a parent as well. And so like, mm. you know, you're constantly like, you know, <laughs> you're teaching all sorts of different things from how yeah. to sit at a table to eat. And to, to, well, you know. we'll see. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not going great. Honestly. That's, yeah. Yeah. I know. That's right. But, um, not, not, a, I'll, I'll talk about, uh, I've talked about a lot of things that are not directly related to teaching. And so like, and you know, like I, I like the broken record podcast too. And then like yeah, there's, yeah, there's some great. things there like tapping into creativity and just like how, you yeah. know, creating creative spaces for good things to happen. And that needs to, be, you know, like our classroom should be more creative spaces than maybe what they are. And so, yeah. you know, that's sort of, so content wise. Yes. But okay, I think, you know, you might be the one that maybe doesn't directly identify as a teacher. I was going to say, I never thought of myself that way, but it's very interesting to think of myself that way. Obviously the explains in the title of the show, I wouldn't say it's sarcastic or ironic <laughs> or anything, but there is sort of a sardonic, you know, it's, it's obnoxious. It's mildly sort of playfully obnoxious in that, like, I, 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 I never really thought of myself as really explaining it. Right. You know, it's, it's, I, I'm offering my perspective and hopefully a new way of, of hearing a song or thinking about this era in general, but I, you know, it's, it's not like I'm explaining, you know, the correct answer to a math problem. You know, explain has always been a funny word. It's always been the right word, but I, it, it's, there is, there is a self knowing, there is a, a, a knowing sort of self effacing aspect to it, at least the way that I've always thought about it. But did you, I mean, I guess, you know, going on that line, when you, when you create the title and you start putting out episodes and you kind of put, you kind of put that weight on you a little bit. I mean, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> and so I mean, was, every episode yeah. taking them seriously, right? Yeah, I it's. I'm trying to think of the exact process by which we picked that title, but it's just you know we wanted to do a show that was song based, right? That it just every every episode was about one song, and how do we organize that? You know, decades. A good way to organize that, you know, what's something in the past, but not too far in the past. What's like a very distinct era that like sort of, I guess the ringer demographic, however you would describe it. It just, the nineties suggested itself really quickly as sort of the sweet yeah. spots of, of nostalgic, but still affecting, you know, music, culture, everything that's happening today. It felt like both the past and the present in, in the right proportion. And so it's like 60 songs from the 90s, right? Like you need you need something else, some other framework and just trying to sketch out what that decade felt like. Like what are the 60 songs that would do that? And how do you how do you honor, you know, such a, a broad period of time with just an incredibly infinitely broad, you know, spread of experiences that people had, like, how do you encapsulate that in 60 songs? And it's an impossible task sort of definitionally, like it's hilarious and almost arrogant <laughs> to even try, but you got to try. Right. And I, it's, yeah, it's, I, again, I had never thought of myself as teaching or like using these framing them or, or perceiving them as, as, as lectures, but obviously it's, it's me talking, you know, yeah. like I, even the phrase, even the term monologue, has never felt quite right to me, though it is sort of definitionally what I'm doing, right? It's just me talking for 20 minutes. You know, there's only so many ways to describe what that would be. It's it's like, is, is it a monologue? Is it a, is it a soliloquy? Like lecture felt a little too stern, but it is, you know, me talking and people listening, you know, and that's that sort of teaching at a foundational level. Well, even too, I, I mean... It well, I was just trying to think because I, I was, I said host, but you're more than a host. I mean, it's like the, and so the format is, yeah, there's like the lecture format or the, <laughs> for lack of a better term, yes. All right, lecture, the then we have a conversation yeah. and then there's a mm -hmm. chance to listen to the song. And so, exactly. yeah. but the thing is, is that people's experience with these songs has been for, you know, could be decades now, like with how it they're is, yeah. taking up the music 
And then, Mm -hmm. you know, then the, uh, wow, someone wants to dive in and and talk. And so like to have somebody, you know, dissect a a song. And I would say it's almost like a radio play with the different, you know, you insert all the different music segments and things like Mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Um, And which, you know, that, that is in uh, in and of itself. And even trying to explain to my daughter again, the, the click is beforehand. No, no, no. That's a very (laughs) specific sound of a Walkman being, being hit by and right, she's like, What's right, a, yeah. what is that? <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, there's yeah. just an infinite number of ways to feel old That's having right. these conversations with people younger than ourselves. Very disturbing. You know, what's Pac-Man? That's you right. know, yeah. what's the click? What's a VCR? Right. Like on and on. And it's terrible. It's but then even cool. then at the end is we get the song again. And mm-hmm. so it's like we've had experience with the song. You get your chance to dissect it. There's a conversation about it which could be very interesting. I think the, with the uh, night swimming on the REM where you, your guests like hated it. <laughs> Jay, yeah. Jay hated it. People yeah, are still like mad it. at me about that. Yeah. But that's, and then here yeah. it is again and listen to it again. So <laughs> right. like it's, it's a, it's, it's a way again, there's, it's, it must be effective because they said, Hey, Rob, you don't have to stop at 60. You can keep right. going. Yeah. I it's, I I've, I've gotten a great response to this and honestly I've been writing for 20 plus years and it's the, this is the most response I've ever gotten, you know? And I, I have to imagine that in some, that's just a function of people are hearing my voice, right? This is my first time doing, you know, I've guessed it on other podcasts, sort of one-offs, but this is my first time doing anything like this. Anything you could describe as radio, you know, or monologues yeah. or any of those things. And I, Intimacy is is the wrong word again, but I there's something about me just speaking directly into people's ears, right through their earbuds or whatever. Like it's I, I described it recently to somebody else as like a conversation, you know, just where the other person isn't talking, but almost the the pauses are there to acknowledge to allow for you know, where the other person would be talking. As you said, like, I can't imagine the show without the clips themselves, just even if they're eight to 10 second clips or even yeah. shorter. I, I, it's, I, I'm building the the show around the song and around pieces of the song and I'm interacting with the song. And I, I couldn't imagine just doing this with me talking, 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 like the music breaks and just the the sort of multimedia aspect of it is tremendously important. And I, and I guess too, that, that comes back to, um, you know, maybe there's some impetus to like have a podcast like this, like, you know, in the episode description, it talks about, you know, the anchor plus music segments Mm -hmm. that if you wanted to do that, like, was it, was it like Spotify comes in like, Hey, we've got this, we've got this new format and do you want to play Rob, do you want to play with this? Do you want to try something out? Do you want to, uh, give it a whirl? We, I, when we started talking about this show, which was the summer of 2020, I was not aware that that was going on. It's, it's called music and talk. It was Spotify's initiative. And the point was that you could insert whole songs, like whole Spotify tracks into your podcast and a show like Bandsplain. I don't know mm-hmm. if you ever listen to Bandsplain. Like I, I think that's the best use of it so far, honestly, because like they talk, uh, you know, they're taking a whole era. So I guess that we, we talked about YouTube for like four hours, right? And we talk about <laughs> yeah. early YouTube and then we play Sunday, Bloody Sunday in full. And like she does that, Yasi Salik, who hosts the show, like th- there'll be like 10, 15 songs, full songs. And that's sort of a moving from music to talk and music to talk. Like what we're sort of cheating in the sense that our song is right at the end. And I, I I keep saying that I don't have the stats and I don't know if the stat exists of who gets to the end of our episode and then listens to the full song. I don't know if we can track that or not. I'm guessing maybe we can. But I, I the platonic ideal for me is that you take a song, you know, like I we're coming back. It's going to be tomorrow as you and I are talking. But by the time this is out, uh, the first episode back is Baby One More Time. It's Britney Spears, Sweet. right? And that's yeah. that's a song people okay. have heard billions of times and have yeah. a very specific, you know, set of feelings about already. But the the hope, you know, as naive as it might sound, is like I talk about it. I talk to a guest about it. And then you hear it again and you're you're hearing the song with the perspective that I have just provided. And even if a little bit, even if you hear it a little differently or listen for other things or just approach it from a different angle, that's the hope, you know, that that you can hear the song anew, that you can hear Hey Jealousy, 
you know, or California love or whatever it is, songs you've heard a billion times, songs you already love, songs you already hate, but it's, it's somebody else's different perspective can change your own perspective. And that music and talk initiative, I, you know, it's used for a lot of different things, but of course I'm biased toward the ones that are specifically about music and specifically yeah. trying to do that. Like we're playing you a song, maybe you've heard it before and maybe you haven't, but even if you have heard it before, we're gonna, we're gonna show you a new way of hearing it. And so like the, um, the responses that you've been getting around like the song. So like, for example, that you talked about, Hey, Jealousy, like mm-hmm. the, the story behind that song, like in, in the, of the band and of the, the lead singer was, yeah. it, yeah, was it the lead? The, it was the, a guitar player. It was the, the guitar lead player. guitarist and the songwriter. Yeah. It was, I mean, it just like, I, I know I interacted with somebody else around the pot. Like, did you know that about Hey, Je- I mean, like, and yeah. it's this boppy song that you think, mm-hmm. but like, oh my gosh, the, when you, then right. you listen to it and it's like, just like we've been saying, you mm-hmm. can get behind the scenes of it. Yeah. And it's sometimes it's like that, right? I, I think people, I think a lot of people, not everybody, but a lot of people know sort of the bare bones of that story that like the songwriter and the lead singer, you know, committed suicide and then the band got huge. And now, they, mm-hmm. you know, they're still touring behind that album 30 <laughs> years later, rightfully. And but I going into a little more detail, you know, and exploring it a little bit, I, I think that was my second episode yeah. ever. Mm-hmm. And so I that early on, and that's another one where the guest for that episode was Hanif Abdurraki, which I'm sure you know. I mean, he's 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 a famous Columbusite now, you know, <laughs> author, poet, Renaissance man. And and he suggested there was like a long, long list of songs at that point, obviously. And he kind of pulled that one out. And I don't know if I would have done it if he hadn't suggested it. And I like it when that happens. Cause that, now I, I'm starting from a place of finding a new perspective on a song that I've heard a billion times. And I was like, maybe I'll talk about this. This isn't necessarily the most important thing to me. You know, the first 10 episodes I'd want to do, but when I go to it and I knew the guy's story a little bit, but to dive deeper into it, it's always rewarding, you know, yeah. to have to have somebody else sort of lead you down this path that you didn't know you didn't want to be on necessarily or you did, you wouldn't have picked that path. But there's there's a reward in that. So I was wondering about the the specifics of the of the 90s, like would <laughs> you're thinking about the night. So like, is it just because I don't know, I think you and I are around the same age, like that's yeah. why like this is in tune or I mean something special about the nineties. And I was, I was looking up what, when does, when did Napster come out? Late, and like, you late nineties, it was like 98, 99. I think it took arguably a few years before it was, you know, this dominant destructive force, but yeah, it was late nineties. So I wonder like, is this like when technology is, is it at its highest when music can be put out, but it's still, there's still kind of like a, a main, like a funnel, or I think I've heard Chris Ryan call it like a monoculture sort of situation mm-hmm. happening where, you know, you're watching MTV and you get exposed to all sorts of different music yeah. that is happening. Like the stuff that you like, like, Oh, I'd never heard of that one. And I get exposed to it. So like this, where maybe we're still, there's still a little, uh, that there's, there's not so much music that, but we're still getting exposed to that, that there is something about the nineties here. Like, I don't know. What, what is it about the nineties? I guess. I mean, for me, it has to start with the fact that I went to high school and college in the 90s. You know, I was a teenager. I was a young adult in the 90s. There's nothing more important about the 90s <laughs> right. than that to me. You know, I, I I firmly believe that the music that you listen to, you know, when you're a teenager, you know, and a post teenager is the most important music to you going forward almost all the time. And so I'd have to start from that place Absolutely. And from there, I can sort of retrofit like that kind of idea, right? Like this is, this is the internet exists, but is not the internet, right? It's not, is not the crazy dominating force that it would become. And you had to buy CDs. And as you say, you're sort of stuck with what's on the radio, stuck with what's on MTV, you know, stuck with what your classmates in high school are listening to. And they're stuck with MTV and the radio too. Like it seemed, it seemed smaller, you know, that you, you, the idea of, of a streaming service in 1995, (laughs) the idea that you go, like, I, I've talked about it. I've talked about sitting and listening to the radio for hours hoping they would play the sweater song so I could tape it off the radio. Like it's, it's, it just feels like I was on another planet. 
yeah. at that point. And so you can talk about the 90s as distinct in that way. And, you know, of course, I've thought about, you know, when this show ends, like, what would I do next? You know, would I go to the 80s? Would I go to the 70s? Would I go to the 2000s? You know, the aughts. And first of all, like, the aughts is a phrase I've never quite dug. But second of <laughs> no, all, like, yeah. are the aughts as a decade as distinct do they have as distinct an identity as the 90s do? And I've seen a lot of, of course, a lot of arguments about that. And a lot of arguments that, you know, the 90s, you know, Chuck Klosterman's book that just came out about the 90s. I forget exactly how he phrased it, but it's like this was the last decade that worked as a distinct yeah. era of time. That's not the way he put it, but he he tried to posit that, that like the 90s was the last time that you could take a decade and say like the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, like the aughts doesn't work that way. The 2010s, musically, culturally, obviously we're too close to it to know, but there's something also distinct about the 90s as just there's an entire culture that you can sum up in your head when someone says the 90s. And that's not exactly necessarily true, you know, for the decades since then. But again, it's when I started this show, I had the idea that there, I had two distinct audiences and it was people like me, people in you know their 40s probably who lived, who were in high school and or college in the 90s, who had this very important nostalgic connection and we could sort of explore that nostalgia. And the other half was young people who maybe know these songs and maybe they don't, but don't have that personal connection, didn't grow up with it. And I guess that's, if there's a teaching element to the show, that's where it would be. Like uh, this is that's where I'm trying to explain to you why this mattered and why it was important to young people then, and why it's still, you know, enriching for you as a young person to know it now. And based on the feedback that I've received, which again is the most feedback I've gotten, and everything, like nostalgia is the driver of the show. The person most interested in this show is going to be, you know, I get a lot of. DMs from 40 something dads. You know, I get a lot of tweets saying this Hello. show is yeah. tailor made for 40 something dads. And like, I don't, I don't run from that. Like, that's what I am. You know, it's not exactly shocking that that's, you know, the demographic most interested in this show. But I, I do hold out. I try and keep in mind that sometimes I am talking to someone who didn't live through this and I, yeah. it's me trying to explain what it was like you know when hbo you know was just a channel you know that played police academy sequels <laughs> all day and you had no control over it where prestige tv didn't exist where you had to buy cds for 18 dollars right. you know on and on and on all these things that just feel like ancient history you know and make me feel instantly 20 years older but there's value in trying to get across, you know, that context and what it felt like and what these songs furthermore made you feel. Yeah. So, you know, in thinking about it as a, again, going back to this idea of, of teaching better and thinking about that, like you yeah. basically like you set like, I'm okay, we're going to explain the nineties. That's the, that's what we're going to be doing. And now we're going to think about you know, tongue in cheek, uh, but we're, we're going to be selecting. And, and this is another reason why I wanted to talk to you. Like, I talk to my teachers about identifying moments of growth from their teaching. So like identify these moments, like, Oh my gosh, a kid just did something, explained something in a different way. Uh, yeah, yeah. did something a, with, you know, a, a breakthrough. table. Yeah, yeah. A breakthrough. Yeah. And it was, or a kid explaining to some, someone else, like I didn't need to intervene. And like, Oh my goodness, kids can teach kids. Like it's like, there's yeah. a mile mark of their growth as a teacher. Okay. And so these moments, right. And so yeah. you're basically, it seems like in this, is podcast you are identifying moments through these songs and like you in the trailer for the the podcast you talk about you know the bjork song that made you cry like th that's obviously a moment of your development as yeah. a music listener where like something that hits you that close right and yeah. so how do you go about selecting the songs i mean you talk about some interaction here but because there's an idea like you pr there's you want it to be representative but then mm -hmm. there's also the personal side. Like you can't, right. you can't avoid that. You're a part of it. So how did right. you, how are you, how did you negotiate that? Well, you know, you start with a pretty hellacious uh, Google doc or series <laughs> of them. Right. And you, yeah. okay. Songs from the nineties, like go. And, you just, <laughs> <laughs> and so suddenly you've got 200 songs. Right. And it's, yeah. you know, I, okay. So immediately you can pick out 20, 25 
songs that are sort of non-negotiable right like not picking this song is like a choice right not mm-hmm. talking about biggie ever not talking about lauren hill right you know not talking about nirvana you know it was sort of looming over the whole thing like there, there's sort of not mandatory but uh, it's you know it's, it's obnoxious you know you're going to have to explain why you're not going to use this or talk about this or or, or do a whole episode on this artist this song mm-hmm. this album if you don't do that and so that's the first bucket and the second one is you know songs that are sort of on the cusp of that you know they're 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 not necessarily the first 20 songs you think of when you think of the 90s but they're tremendous they're huge hits they're enduring you know young people know them now they're tremendously important there's plenty of context to provide like it's it's just a tier system develops right yeah. like necessary ideal you know maybe you know and then you get into stuff as you say that is more personal like one of the things one of the other tightropes i've sort of been negotiating this whole time is like how personal to get how much do people want to know you know about my personal life or my personal feelings or like just the the very mundane but very you know important to me things that happened to me when i was a teenager and my thought there has always been that like it's not that i'm inherently interesting or that my stories are inherently interesting but me talking about my history gets you thinking about your own history you know it just sort of spurs you to to revisit you know your own personal memories with the songs or other songs like it right it's 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 not about me thinking that I'm inherently the subject here, but I, I talk about it in a way that hopefully gets you thinking about it in your personal connections. And so I I want to keep that balance between like the obvious ones or the necessary feeling ones and, you know, I guess wild cards, you know, just, just sort of flights of fancy or, or things that are particularly important to me that are sort of outliers to a lot of other people and trying to make the case that this, you know, this is more important than you thought it was like cake is an example, right? Like, I don't think anyone would, well, I don't know that for a fact, but you know, cake is not Nirvana, right? You know, cake, cake are held in a different kind of esteem, but a very high profound esteem by the people who love them, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and as somebody who does, you know, I wanted to try and make the case for them, you know, as more than just a couple songs that were on the radio for a while that felt kind of fluky, like there was a lot going on there. And it's like a very specific wavelength and it's pretty goofy, you know, and if I, I don't blame people for being turned off by it, frankly. But for me, it was tremendously important and that's worth explaining. And so that balance is important. And that's the huge reason why we jumped from 60 to 90, because like it wasn't halfway through, but it was pretty close to after halfway through, right? With like 20 songs left, it's like, oh my God. <laughs> you know, like if we just focus on those necessary songs, like we're done. Like we yeah, have no yeah, yeah. flexibility anymore. And like I obviously I want to know what's coming like the next three to five, roughly, hopefully, but I want to allow for that flexibility. I want to allow for guests to make the case for artists, for songs that I really wasn't thinking about. If I just wake up one day and think, I want to listen to a lot of Tori Amos. I don't know why I've not thought of Tori Amos yet. Like that just sounds really like, I want to be able to pivot and have room to maneuver and have that flexibility. And, and, and sort of I'm negotiating that with, again, this block of songs and we've gotten through a lot of them. We've gotten through arguably most of them, depending on how you define it, but it's, it's, sort of a mixture of the necessary, you know, and the surprising, hopefully. Yeah. No, I, I liked, um, you know, it just going back to being the the personal side, like, you know, that, that is good teaching right there. So like, you know, if you're, hmm. but we talked about developing relationships and the first is the like right. developing a relationship with the teacher. Like if, and even though it's, it's more one-sided, like we're learning about you, but like, mm-hmm. as you're, you're, you're doing the episode, it's uh good to be king by tom petty um, and yeah. like you know like hearing the song when you talk about being a father like there is like oh there's some I- identification with my own experience as a, as a dad or a parent or singing the thing yeah. about the songs that i was singing to my kid when 
probably with content, I probably shouldn't have been singing to my baby at the time, but <laughs> all right. Ah, they won't it, remember. Yeah. yeah. They won't remember it, but it worked, but like developing that relationship then allows, you know, the other side where you're learning about some hard stuff. There's some, I mean, there's some episodes where you talk about some really difficult topics yeah. when you talk about Fiona Apple criminal, like in other things, like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to hang in here. Cause I've, I've, maybe I don't want to, um, this happened, this was a part of it, but then I still have this, uh, this relation. And I want to learn, I want to keep learning. I want to keep engaging in the space. Yeah. And so there is something about that, having that mix and getting yeah. what I would say is almost like shoved a little bit. And a good teacher is going to shove you like, so either it be through the, some of the content that you're doing or, and I, I say like shoving, I call it like a cognitive shove. Like you get <laughs> like, huh, Rob picked that song for yeah. uh, like, <laughs> like right. for that okay. content or, I mean, maybe you get shoved too, where um, I think what Bill Simmons came on and, and talked about mayonnaise uh, from yeah, shoot, Smashing, no, Pumpkins. Smashing Pumpkins. Smashing Pumpkins. And yeah. it sounded like that was like, huh. Like you kind of had like, huh, Bill, yeah. that's interesting. Come come talk about that. So like, yeah, I, go ahead. Well, okay. Sorry. Um, so, no, I loved Smashing Pumpkins in high school. Absolutely. But I wouldn't have picked mayonnaise. You know, that's a good example. What would like, you have picked? I, that's a good question. I think I would have gone with 1979. That's what I would have done. Yeah. And and it's not, I don't know what my favorite Smashing Pumpkin song is, like Soma. And I, I, that's, that's, it's a good question what my personal favorite one would be. That's a good question that I just asked myself. <laughs> uh, uh, but 1979 feels like the most representative. And that song is obviously about nostalgia, right? And so, like, oh, yeah. so due to the sort of mirror to the mirror thing of now I'm nostalgic about a song, et cetera, et cetera. But no, right, when right. he said mayonnaise, it's like, oh, that's really, I really want to know why he picked that song. And I love that song too. Like, let's do that, right? I So what what you're talking about, I never want it to feel like, like this is a very special episode of, yeah, yeah, you know, sure. I, I never want to have to, to completely change the tone when it is a darker thing, but I, Fiona Apple was that way. Aaliyah was really that way. Yes, you know, yeah. I, Aaliyah, I, I dreaded doing for a long time just because I could not figure out the tone mm. of that episode, how you talk about the darkness and the ugliness and like trying to separate that from the music itself. Like right. the, it, you can't. And so I try and spread those. I mean, that's why I was hesitant to do Britney Spears for so long, you know, yeah. I, and partly because she's like a, an active news story, like constantly, right. like I was writing the thing and that, that was the, the, the day she got pregnant or announced that she was pregnant. Right. Like there's just, it's, there's just a timeliness element yeah. to Britney Spears more than anybody else. But so, yeah, I wanted to spread those out and have a mix of like very frivolous episodes like I achy breaky heart or something, <laughs> and then go into like a Tori Amos or Fiona Apple. And it does tend to be the hardest the hardest episodes, both in terms of like, man, this is just tough, you know, material yeah. to revisit. And this is tough to find the tone to talk about it are the female artists and it's mm -hmm. not their music. It's the coverage of them, right? right? Like reading old interviews with Tori Amos or Fiona Apple or even Bjork to an extent, you know, Leah, it's just, it's, it's, it's ugly. A lot of it yeah. is really ugly. And it's, I don't want to sit here as like enlightens, like we solved it 2022 man, where it's right, like, right. I know exactly. I'm going to tell you exactly why this is bad. I would never do any of that. You know, like that tone, you know, and that sort of faked authority is just sounds so false to me. I don't want to. So that's part of the tone that's right. part of the tonal challenge is, is trying to talk about this stuff and talk about why it was so terrible, but not sound like I'm lecturing or hectoring or like I'm above it. Right. right? And then the other part of it is the personal stuff. Like the, the Tom Petty episode was my second to last, you know, yeah. and it was when I announced that we were doing another 30. And I guess at that point, I was operating under the assumption that I did, you know, the show had connected in some modest way with some modest group of people, you know, and again, those tended to be people like me, you know, in their forties now who had, you know, this sort of teenage connection to this music. And, and what I divulge about my personal life or just anything, any even mundane man, anecdotes that I tell, like that's been a slow progression, you know, of how much of that, can I work in, you know, that's of interest to people, how much, you know, 
sort of protecting my privacy and my family's privacy at the same right. time. But that's the Tom Petty episode was sort of a mile marker where it's like, you know, I can talk a little bit, you know, about my kids and about, you know, the experience when my kids were born and the hardships that we had and, and get a little more personal. I don't think too much. So hopefully, and I don't think indulgently, but I, as you say, that's the breakthroughs for me have been sort of the realization that, you know, I am, I do have an audience, I guess, and I have a sense of who that audience is and how they think and what they like about that show, what this show and what they what they want from me or expect from me based on what I've already done and like what I can what I can share that's more personal, you know, and what's you know, stuff that they're still not interested in. There's a line. There's gonna there's a line where it's too much of me. There's a line where it's too goofy, you know, and it starts to feel like a Looney Tunes cartoon. Like I'm sort of navigating all this in real time, but it's it's sort of naturally developed to that point with that episode where it could feel a little more personal and a little more, yeah, emo is a glib word, but you know, it was yeah. that was that was more that was a heavier one from my perspective as opposed to like the nineties media's right. perspective. Yeah. So, I mean, you talk about that. So that's second to last episode. And, and then I think Allison Chains Wood was the last mm-hmm. episode. And so going all the way back to the beginning, uh, you ought to know was the first episode. So mm-hmm. in between there, if you listen to that first one, you listen to those last two, <laughs> it's different, right? Your teaching uh-huh. is different, Rob. So, oh, so my. yeah. And so this is what I would say to my students. Like there's something that there are some changes in there. So maybe just one or two things you're like, Hey, we're going to do this from now. This is something like, this was something, some feedback or whatever. That's like, this is how we're going to do these episodes. I mean, the first thing I would say, and I've said before, is that just on a word count basis, I believe the first episode on You Ought to Know is like 1,300. Uh, I yeah. believe Tom Petty and or Alice in Chains were like seven, eight. You know, the show has gotten like five times longer. <laughs> That's the first thing that feels very important. Um, again, I've never done anything like this before, you know, uh, guesting on other podcasts and stuff. And I feel pretty awkward, you know, doing that. But I so this is a new thing that I'm learning. And then there is enough DNA of what I've always done, which is it's me in a Google Doc. And like, obviously, these are scripts. They are written out word for word. You know, yeah. I, I cannot be extemporaneous or like riff or whatever <laughs> these things at all. And so it is me writing a thing. And immediately the challenge was how is it going to change how I write that I'm saying it out loud, that the final product is an audio thing and not just, you know, the writing itself. And there were mechanical things there. The sentences are shorter, you know, they're simpler. Like I am less apt, I think, to sort of lapse into rock critic speak or whatever like i have this sort of sardonic voice that just comes out of me whenever i'm like it was an incendiary you know (laughs) angular coruscating guitar squall etc like i sort of avoiding that and so but that tone and the realization that this was the same in some way and that it's still me writing but it's different in very crucial ways and that i have to say it out loud I am developing, I need a better word than intimacy, but intimacy with like listeners, you know, it's a different format. It's a different experience. I'm delivering it differently. It's going to be received differently. And I don't think there was ever like a hard point where I pivoted into some specific change to how I did this, but it's been a very gradual change. And first of all, like the episode, you know, if I mapped them out on a graph or whatever, you know, the episodes would get longer, 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 longer. And that's the most important thing, but that speaks to a comfort an increased comfort that I had with the format and an increased willingness or interest in sort of getting deeper into it, you know, and if I could somehow map like personal asides personal stories from my youth or whatever, like those have increased over time, you know, like, like jokes, you know, and like oh, yeah. I, stuff like that. It's, it's, it's all been intuitive, you know, and my, my editor, Justin sales has been crucial this whole time and sort of shaping this and looking at the scripts. And we talk about, you know, what episodes to do with songs, artists, you know, I've, I've had a lot of help. My producers, you know, Isaac, Devin, and now Kerm have, have, 
they make it sound good. You know, they take a raw file and they, they put all that together. But I, it, it is me at the end of the day, just sort of navigating this new format that has a lot of similarities with what I used to do and what I still do to an extent, and but a lot of differences too. And it's been fascinating to me, if only to me, just how that has slowly developed over time. And I don't think there's like light switch, light yeah, yeah. bulb type revelations, but like I'm, I'm realizing things in a slow burn over time, you know, how much of myself I can bring in to something, how deep to go, like how, you know, how discursive to get, right? Like, do people want me to like ramble about something that feels unrelated for 2000 words only to surprise them with like, haha, you know, this is actually about Britney Spears or whatever, or like, should I, focus more <laughs> and not do that. Some people like that and some people don't. And, and so in the feedback loop, you know, to have people emailing me, DMing me or just sending me Twitter messages or whatever, again, this is more feedback than I've ever had. And that's shaping the show. I'm, you know, even if subconsciously, like I'm getting a sense of what people dig about it. And, and I'm obviously leaning more in that direction. So all of that has happened gradually, but all of that is absolutely happening all the time. It's still happening. So we'd say as teacher speak, you're, you're assess you're doing that assessment, getting that information, there we go. put it back mm -hmm. in. There you go. Fantastic. That's right. People, you know, Twitter is, is uh, my teacher evaluation form 24 <laughs> seven. That's right. <laughs> Uh, so you're, uh, and I, again, I appreciate your time and, and, and I want to honor Absolutely. it. Um, sure. so you're doing 30 more songs. Um, yeah. And I don't know, just. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. I, yeah. Right. I was just, I have right. more of a question, but I'm like, so what do you, what do you hope? I don't know if you have a hope to teach, like, like, you know, so it's almost like you get another semester or, you know, No, I mean, that's the way to think about it is another season. Another semester is a fine way to think about it. That's yeah. lovely. There we go. The there spring go. semester. Um, I mean, it, it partly that was just a function again of like, we have 15 episodes to go and we have like 50 songs that we really want to do. What the hell are we going to do? Let's do more. You know, there wasn't, we weren't thinking of this as a specific block with a different or a specific tone, you know, and when we did, when we knew, and we knew for a while that we were doing more before we'd announced it, like a lot of songs that we would have done in the original block of sixties, you know, we punted further down the road to sort of, again, spread out, you know, a mix of like the obvious ones, the biggest ones with like the more frivolous feeling ones. And so that, what do I hope for these next 30? I mean, I've written two of them. I'm trying to think, you know, I came back from a two month, you know, paternity leave where I was just sort of around my kids all day, every day. And I'm trying to think if there's a tone that this show has even early on that suggests something new or different. I think there's, I think looking at the whole list of episodes i think again that tom petty episode if there is one moment of sort of a turning point it would be that and that's not a gear i want to be in all the time and i'm, I'm not trying yeah. to tell everyone my heaviest stories my most personal stories all the time but like to have done that and to have gotten you know a, a good response from it from some people you know that's there's a permission there right that's important, you know, and, and this is something that I can do too. This isn't something I'll do all the time, but it's, there's sort of an increased connection that I feel that I have with some people listening. And that's, that's important to know going forward. And so I, again, these, they're crazy long, both of the new ones coming back and Brittany was sort of logically that way, but the one after that was less, you know, hypothetically important than Brittany, but I still talked and talked and talked and talked <laughs> forever. And so these things continue to get longer. You know, I am absolutely bumping up against that ceiling. I don't want them to get any longer than they are, but like I keep, they, the, the world keeps expanding and I just keep talking more, you know, and I don't think there's any change to this show that's as impactful as just that one. Just, yeah. just the, sheer, the sheer length, mass, you know, density of it. But you got to throw in a couple of those uh, third-eyed blind, semi-charmed life sort of episodes where it just seems like right. 
Rob's just having fun here. <laughs> right. Yes. Right. <laughs> Cracking yes. himself up. That's great. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the, the laughing on mic, right? Like I, it's genuine, right? Like, but I don't want it to feel fake or performative, right? Like I, like I'm, like I'm doing an audition or something. Like it's, it's weird. The tone of it's weird. Cause I, you know, I haven't, I, I'm not a performer in any sense. You know, I've, I've never done theater or even really radio beyond college radio like this. I don't want to go too far, you know, again, in that sort of goofiness, you know, funny voices direction. But like there's a lot of that early on now. And so I guess I am sort of trying to play with the performance aspects of it without it getting too indulgent. Well, I, I, I'll just speak for the uh, 40 year old nostalgia audience. <laughs> I, I know. And, and I know <laughs> I've had conversations with folks like, Hey, you got to listen to this. And, and yeah, everyone well, that has like, they're responding well. And obviously you get that feedback as well. So I don't know, just, I'm excited for the next 30. I'm excited uh, for you having this conversation and just uh, yeah. thinking about uh, Rob, the teacher. Now we could add that to your, uh, to your description. There we go. Rob, I'm an educator. Like teacher. An there honorary an professor. <laughs> That's we right. Well, thank you so much for your interest, man. And thank you so much for talking. Well, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate you. Yeah. So, so that happened. Rob Harvilla joined me. That was, that was uh, super cool. I mean, it's one of those things where I don't know. And maybe this, I'm not going to assume that anyone is like that for me, but I mean, with 60 songs that explain that and he released it one week at a time. And so, you know, potentially for 60 weeks, I've had a, an appointment listening with Rob Harvilla while I'm going on a walk, uh, with my dog in the morning and cooking breakfast for kids in the morning, you know, like, uh, that's, that's a thing, right? That's the thing. You develop a relationship with someone and you hear his teaching and you hear about the stories he talks about. It's like, wow, I feel like I kind of, but then you're like, I'm never going to actually talk to them. And then you actually do. You connect with them and he comes on your podcast. That's pretty cool. Uh, anyway, I'm, I am fanboying now. Um, but it was just, it was fun. It was fun to have him, fun to have a conversation with him. And then also just to, to hear the evolution of his teaching and to hear how interesting it was, like the building of the relationship part, the being a little bit more personal. And I think as a teacher, those are t- sorts of things that I connected with too as well as like, I realized I was kind of like, hey, well, this is, you know, professional life, this is personal life. And I realized the more I got into things, like the more I'm overlapping. I love living where I am. I live in Oxford, Mississippi. And like, I have an overlapping life where my, I mean, at one point, my caught my barista at Starbucks became my student, became my babysitter and became my child's teacher twice. (laughs) And it's, I like that. I like that a lot. I like that worlds are overlapping a little bit. And so, um, so this is kind of cool that I had a chance to, um, interact with Rob on the podcast. So that brings me to, um, I have a list I have a list of people that I'd like to have on, and I'm just going to put it out there just in case people have connections, uh, try, try making connections with folks, but anyway, whatever, you know, so coach Bennett of the Nike run club. So if you have the Nike run club app and you listen to any of the guided runs, coach Bennett is on a couple of them. I'd like him to be on the podcast. Cause I think, there's some things that he's teaching me how to be a runner, how to put on the identity of a runner. And it, there's some pretty effective things I'd like to talk to. Like, how is he thinking about that? How is he putting that out? That'd be a cool one. Jess Sims of Peloton. <laughs> I can't believe I'm sharing this. Jess Sims of Peloton. I think she'd be a cool person to have on the podcast, talk about her teaching. I mean, especially during the pandemic when it was like you were truly teaching remote and trying to think like, how do I connect with an audience that I – that either it's maybe some brief things on a screen, but I'm trying to help push them to a place, put them on the identity of someone who's a fitter version of themselves. How do I do that? Right. So I saw that in her teaching. Um, JJ Peterson of story brand. Um, I think he's uh, got a, I think an EDD from uh, Vanderbilt and he helps businesses learn how to tell their story better. And I think there's something about and and the, the part of a company that Donald Miller founded uh, called StoryBrand, and I think he does a really good job of teaching f- 
through the various things, podcasts and webinars that I've seen them on, um, of teaching folks about how to tell their story, how, how to refine their own marketing and things like that. And I think there's something about that with regards to teaching, like how do we help students enter into a story? And I'd like to, one, tap in expertise on that. How do we do that better as teachers? But then also just thinking about like, well, how does he teach? How does he think about his own teaching? Because I know, he, I mean, he is a teacher. So, and again, and that goes back to my conversation with Rob about who is a teacher. And I think about, are you influencing a relationship with content? Because people are learning all the time. But if you can direct learning towards something, if you're influencing the learning of uh, someone else's learning of something in particular, that's teaching, right? And so we all are doing that in a way. I mean, even you know, from social media posts to conversations we have, we're, we're teaching. So um, book recommendation, whatever. So anyway, there's three, three people. There's more on the list, but won't just reveal everything right now. Get a little vulnerable. Anyway, thank you for listening to this episode. This is a great episode. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to share it. This, thanks for listening to this episode of the Eminem Planet Podcast. So, uh, share it if you want. I mean, love listening to Rob. If you're a fan of the 60 Songs That Explain the 90s podcast, go listen to that. I mean, seriously, if you just, if you've, again, if you've never listened to 60 Songs That Explain the 90s, here's the top, t- uh, the first 10 songs. I'll just tell you. Alanis Morissette, You Ought to Know, Gin Blossoms, Hey Jealousy, Wu-Tang, uh, Clan, Cream, Missy Elliott, The Rain, Super Duper Fly, Guns N' Roses, November Rain, Ghetto Boys, Mind Playing Tricks on Me, Mariah Carey, All I Want for Christmas is You, Smashing Pumpkins, Mayonnaise, Backstreet Boys, I Want It That Way, Master P, Make Them Say Uh, and The Breeders Cannonball, that might be more than 10, but anyway, it's a cool, it's a cool podcast. If you're familiar with any of that music, or even if you're not familiar with the music, there is something unique about the '90s and the fact that technology was increasing to the point where you know we could share a lot of things, but also it wasn't to the point where we were all kind of in our own spaces. Like the internet hadn't exploded yet, right? We were still in a dial-up zone, and um, yeah, we were still kind of in this, I guess, monoculture or like not monoculture, but like we were still kind of swimming all in the same pool. I guess if you want to say that. And I think it's a unique time, but maybe that's again, also because that's just where I'm from and what my experiences are enough blathering. Thanks for listening to the Amino planet podcast. Go listen to the 60 songs that explain the nineties podcast. You'll thank me later. If you're looking for show notes for this episode, and we'll put links in the show notes. Um, because Rob, I think, mentioned a podcast, I think, called Bandsplain. We'll, we'll put a link to that. Put a link to the 60 Songs Explain the 90s podcast. We'll put a link to the Chris a Chris Farley Show clip if we can find one. Um, and just also, too, the, the Ringer has got a, a number of d- different podcasts, I think, where there's a lot of people that are trying to teach people about things. I think Sean Fennessy, through the big picture, is trying to teach about movies. I think uh, Bill Simmons teaches about uh, basketball through his book of basketball podcast. Um, especially, uh, actually Jackie McMullen talks about NBA icons and the icon club. That was a fascinating series of podcasts. I think that was about 10 episodes anyway. Um, but, and I know other people, have, and I'm a big fan of the ringers podcasts, but I know there's other people that are fan of other podcasts like hardcore history by Dan Carlin and all that stuff for the, uh, we've talked about the broken record podcast on here. And it's kind of, again, a cool medium and just trying to participate in that space. All right, we definitely got to close this thing out. Okay, if you're looking for ways to support the podcast, you can subscribe to the podcast, you can share it, you can rate and review it. Um, you can uh, subscribe to the Eminem Planet download. Uh, that's the email list. You can find links to that at eminemplanet.com. Uh, on the verge of revamping that, man. We're fishing, finishing up finals, but after that, holy cow, watch out. That email list is going to be popping. You can also follow at Amazon Planet on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, or like the Amazon Planet Facebook page. You can also check out the Amazon Planet store, Amazon Planet Bookshop. Links are in the footer at AmazonPlanet.com where your purchases support the production costs of the podcast. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Amazon Planet Podcast. Thanks to Rob Harvilla for sharing his uh, time and expertise. And thanks to Matt Mifflin for the music in this episode. And finally, thank you to all of you out there who are seeking to teach better and be the good in the world by investing in the lives of others. The world is a better place because you have decided to use the gifts you've been given to serve others. Thank you for all that you do. Peace.